What I love to do is introduce the right people to the right people, assemble the smartest people I can think of or reach out to to carry that conversation, and that's exactly what I've done today. Please give my panel a round of applause. Welcome. Okay, guys, Jay Martin here, CEO of Cambridge House, and we are searching for our next investment opportunity. I'm now joined by Randy Smallwood, President and CEO of Wheat and Precious Metals. Randy, how are you? Fine, Jay. Many thanks. Always good to see you. Yeah, it's good to have you back because last time we chatted, it was the spring of 2020. It was April, maybe early May. And the conversation at that point was around a potential emerging bull market in the commodity sector. Uh, and it could have been 10 years ago, considering how many things have changed since that conversation. Well, um, changed since then. Eh? <laughs> yeah, a lot's changed since then. Uh, the commodities market, one of those things. And, um, you know, I thought an interesting place to start, Randy, I mean, as the CEO of Wheaton and from anybody who's not familiar, Wheaton Precious Metals is the largest streaming company in the world when you're looking at revenue generation. And that's coming from streaming deals, predominantly like I think 61 percent of your rev comes from the gold sector, 33 from silver and, and the balance from from platinum. There's one cobalt deal in there, I believe. Um, but projects all over the world and really like the 800 pound gorilla in the space. And so, Randy, why don't we start with, I want to catch up on sentiment right now because the markets, you know, it's, it's heat up a lot since we last spoke. There's a lot of new capital coming to the sector and commodity prices have all risen. I'm hearing two conversations now from my guests. One that is sort of the perma bulls. This is only going to increase. If you look at all the macro trends supporting increased commodity prices, they're all there. And a second that's more tempering that enthusiasm saying prices might be getting ahead of themselves prepare for a pull up, pullback, maybe prepare cash. Uh, but where do you sit in that camp, Randy? Well, I, all, of, all the vectors point towards continued strength in precious metals. Uh, we're gonna see some short-term volatility. Uh, you know, I think that we saw some to the positive with this pandemic, but we have seen precious metal prices rising for many, many years now. And the pandemic uh, and all the all the issues and, and all the uh, challenges that, that, that we as a society see over the, over the last year, that that accelerated us, and of course pushed gold to record highs, and uh, and silver uh, also performed very strongly in that phase. So precious metals definitely did move up. Um, as as we're starting to see a path out of this pandemic, from a, from at least a health perspective, uh, and uh, you know a health of society and and and, and such with uh, with uh, different vaccines becoming now available. Um, you know we're we're going to see some of that uh, that pandemic response come off, but. The key thing to keep in mind is that we still are on a very strong, a continual upward path in precious metals. We haven't seen any change in that. And we're going to see some short term volatility from things like pandemics and, and such. But boy, when you, you know, when you start measuring the economic impacts and costs of this pandemic in terms of trying to restart economies around the world, and the amount of stimulus um, money printing that's going to be required uh, when it comes to is, you know, precious metals and, and, and solid stores of value in the face of that, you know, all the vectors still point towards continued strength in precious metals. Yes, there's going to be ups and downs. There's going to be, uh, you know, sentiment changes and stuff like that. But the fundamentals are, are very strongly still in support of precious metals. Okay. Now I have two questions for you. And Keep in mind, these are coming from, you know, we have a significant portion of our audience. Most of our audience, they're, they're pretty versed and experienced in the precious metals business, but not everybody. You know, we produce a lot of content in the health science sector, uh, in the tech sector. And so we have a lot of investors that came into our audience on the back of those topics and now are curious about how to enter the precious metals business because they see the gains being made in their their interest has peaked. So two questions for you, Randy. Number one, a mistake I often hear investors make when they're new to this game is using the words royalties and streaming interchangeably as if they're the same. So I'd love you to start with that and just provide the difference. What is the difference and what is Wheaton? Well, streaming uh, was, a, was a business model that we invented back in 2004 when we created the original Silver Wheaton, uh, now Wheaton Precious Metals. And, and it, uh, it's, there, there are some similarities from, uh, to a royalty, but there's also some strong differences that uh, actually create more value for us and for our shareholders and for the partner companies. Um, you know, a royalty is basically a registration on land. It's not really a contractual partnership. It's a registration on land where you get 
generally a part of the revenue, no matter where that revenue comes from. And so it's not focused specifically on precious metals or such. It always depends on what's being produced at the asset itself. Streams have the ability, it's a contractual partnership where we actually work with the operating company to come up with the best way to create value. And, and, and you have to recognize that most of our production comes as a byproduct, a non-core byproduct from copper mines and from lead zinc mines and from nickel mines. That's where we get most of our gold and our silver and our palladium, not platinum, but palladium from, is as a byproduct of, of, these, of these base metal mines or even silver sometimes from gold mines. And, and, and it's, a, it's a key thing where streams were allowed to focus on the specific commodity and we structure these contracts so that it, it's a true win-win for both uh, the operator, the mining company, and us, the streaming company, where what we're doing is providing a means for them to crystallize the value of this non-core asset that they have in their copper mine or in their lead zinc mine, this non-core precious metal. And they then take that crystallized value and apply that back into their core focus, which is growing their copper business or their lead zinc business or their nickel business or, you know, investing back into themselves. And we, of course, as, as, a, as, a, as an investor into these assets, get the benefits of all that reinvestment. And so, so streaming is focused. It's, a, it's basically a contractual agreement between parties where we get a certain amount or a certain percentage and it's key it's a certain percentage of whatever that mine produces and if we're if we're if we're <laughs> it's this combination of wise and lucky uh, although you know luck is is generally related to hard work and how much work you put into it and so but if if we're smart in terms of which assets that we invest into and choose assets that continually deliver back to you know their their stakeholders their shareholders uh, um, then then we'll have success and and I would say that that's what we've done at Wheaton. Um, you know, we have, we produce more gold and we've had higher revenues than in any of the other streaming and royalty companies out there. We have an incredible growth profile over the next few years and an incredible capacity in terms of continue investing back into the ground. And, and, you know, we're actually, uh, <laughs> we're, we're probably at a state now where the biggest challenge that we have is being able to put our money back into the ground fast enough. And if we can't do that, then it just means increasing our dividends back to our shareholders. And uh, so it's uh, a good, strong business model. It, it, because of the streaming structure, we don't have the traditional cost risk that mining companies do. Right. Um, but we still get all the upside of exploration success and expansion potential and, uh, and obviously levered exposure to the commodity price that all just delivers superior returns to precious metal investors. Yeah, because all of your terms are agreed to prior in a contract. We see inflated prices, labor, fuel, whatever, all the inputs that go into the mining companies, you're protected from that. And that's why when we say there's protection from the downside of risk, less of a risk profile with the royalty company, that's really what you're talking about. Yes, the streaming company, as I say. <laughs> yeah, there I go. <laughs> yeah, the streaming company, <laughs> less downside risk. <laughs> we'll get everyone changed. Because even like, uh, you know, just to highlight the strength of a streaming uh, agreement, even the traditional royalty companies are now streaming companies. The bulk of their revenue has now come from streams because they recognize that there's just better and more value created from streaming contracts. And, and as you said, Jay, uh, the contract, we make an upfront payment, and for that, we get a percentage of whatever metal is produced. And when that metal is produced, we make a fixed payment on a per ounce basis as that metal is produced to us or delivered to us. And yeah. so there's no cost surprise. Our upfront payment is our capital cost. We know what that is. And, uh, and then as the metal is delivered to us on a per ounce basis, we make a fixed payment on a, on a production basis. And so there's no cost surprises. A huge okay. advantage over traditional mining. Right, right. Okay. And my, my previous comment there is evidence that I don't edit these videos. You get the raw file. Um, perfect timing. Okay. So I want to back up a little bit because you guys have been very active uh, since 2004, invested something like 9 billion into these agreements. Um, the most notable part of that is only two and a half billion came from financing. The balance came from cash flow. Um, so I guess my question though, Randy, is are you going to be as aggressive now that metals prices have risen? Like, is it time to hunt for you still for new deals or is it time to harvest the deals that you have? Um, well, I would say that we're, we're, we're definitely in a stronger market than we were a couple of years ago, but there's still growth and upside. And, and, okay. and what, 
what people have to remember is that our opportunity set doesn't generally come from the gold space. And so when you look around the gold mining companies and the precious metal mining companies in the world, of course, these prices are generating, you know, good, healthy cash flows. And there's not a lot of, not, not a lot of need for outside capital. But our biggest marketplace is actually the base metal producers. And we are starting to see copper, of course, go for a nice run. We're seeing nickel start to wake up a little bit. Lead zinc still lagging a bit, but still in the, in, going in the right direction. And that's where our opportunity set comes from. And, and I have to say the base metal sector has not had a lot of reinvestment over, over the last four or five years. Right. And so what we have now is a lot of base metal focused companies that are looking, they, they see, you know, not only do they see good prices today, but they see the vectors pointing in the right direction that this is the time to perhaps start reinvesting back in to their infrastructure and to uh, expand and, and chase some of that exploration success that, that, you know, that, that they haven't had for so many years and start reinvesting back in. And so we're busier than we've ever been in terms of opportunities out there. The bulk of them coming from base metal companies that, that look at their, look at their non-core precious metals byproduct production and say, wow, precious metal prices are doing okay right now. Maybe it is time to crystallize that value and shift that in. And so, so we do, we are very hopeful that, that, uh, you know, we, we added a couple of deals in 2020, um, smaller scale deals, but still pretty attractive deals that we know will be delivering value to us for a long time. Uh, we've got a pretty good uh, portfolio of corp dev opportunities that we're, we're working on right now and uh, hope to be able to to uh, put some of this cash flow back in. Because as you mentioned, I mean, uh, you know, to date in, in, in wheat and precious metals, we've invested $9 billion into the ground, but we've already returned Seven point two billion in cash flow out of that nine billion. Uh, hence, hence, you know, we've only had to raise a, a bit of money. The amount of cash flow we're generating now at current prices is going to be, uh, you know, um, we should be <laughs> getting pretty close to a billion dollars a year. Uh, it's tough to put that into the ground, uh, um, you know, as fast as uh, as fast as we'd like to. And so, but we're going to try. Yeah, yeah, no doubt. But I guess. You know, that would put you in a position where you're not having to go to the market for capital anymore, right? You'd be able to fulfill all the deals you want to do off of in-house cash flow. Yeah, uh, you know, we, we took the approach back probably six years ago now that, that our preference was not to issue shares. Um, in fact, I'm, I'm proud of the fact that, you know, even since we last talked, we put an ATM in place last year and at the market financing mechanism where you can actually issue shares into the market to raise capital. I guarantee you, we are the only resource company, the only precious metals company that has an ATM in place that hasn't exercised it. Why? Because we've got such strong cash flows. Um, we, we, we're, we're very adverse to issuing shares. And in fact, you know, we've used debt to, to finance and successfully finance, um, the bulk of our acquisitions over the last six or seven years. Um, I knew that. Yeah. You know, and, and, and that debt, uh, you know, here in the first quarter, it is gone. Um, you know, we've, we've, we will, we will have paid it off, uh, here in the first quarter. And so, uh, um, you know, that's that you know in our eyes if we'd have taken a more traditional approach that some of our peers has taken have taken we would have probably had about 16 percent more shares issued in outstanding that is permanent dilution to our existing shareholders that we we chose not to do so right. i'm just i'm proud of that track record in terms of what we've been able to build and how we've built it yeah yeah well for a 24 billion dollar market cap company you don't have very many shares outstanding yeah, it's um, <laughs> and and we're hoping it stays constant. <laughs> yeah, you know, we don't, uh, right now with the amount of cash flow and 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 the access to very reasonably priced debt, um, you know, incredibly attractively priced debt, well below two percent interest rates. Um, you know that that capacity. Um, you know, we've still got plenty of capacity to grow without 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 ever issuing shares again. Okay. Okay. Now I wanted to ask you about um, pent up demand. And, and normally this question comes from a place of M&A activity, right? We haven't been able to travel much. Now, I know you're a geo by trade, right? So you like to get, when I first talked to you, you said you like to get on the ground and kick the dirt, right? When you do these deals. Yep. Uh, obviously, you haven't been able to do that. Has that impacted the amounts of deals that are now stacking up in your pipeline? Is there some pent up demand at Wheaton? Once you're able to get back in an airplane, do you expect activity to increase 
Well, we did close two transactions last year. Uh, the first one, we were fortunate enough to get the site visit in before the pandemic hit. And so that uh, checked it off. But the second one, we, we utilized a combination of, uh, of consultants. You know, it was on uh, Capstone's assets uh, in Mexico, the Cozumel mine. It's an asset that we already had a stream on at one time. We inherited it when we took over a competitor back in uh, 2009, but it had a term to it. And so happy to be back into the Cozumel mine because it is it is a mine that we think would be running for many, many years in, in the future. And we had the advantage of, of knowing the asset because we had a previous stream on it. So we felt comfortable with using uh, consultants, in-country consultants to uh, provide support for our due diligence. I... I do like, uh, I'm a geological engineer and I, I, I like getting in and, and, you know, feeling the, uh, just getting a feel for it. I, you know, I just find when it comes to project reviews, talking to the onsite geologists, getting a feel for the, for the rock, for the geology, uh, I, you know, the more time I spend in this industry, the more respect I have for intuition and, uh, mm-hmm. and intuition is best felt by being on site and just getting a feel for not only the operating team, but the infrastructure, the support, the, the um, you know, if it's an existing operation, you can always tell when, when, when assets are running well and when they're, when, when they're well invested and when they're under invested. And, and so, um, you know, it's, it does prove a challenge. We have found a way around it. We have conducted some site visits and we just have to take some measures to minimize risk as much as we can and, uh, and move forward. And so, you know, as, as, these, as these opportunities arise, we'll find a way around it. It's, uh, it is the one thing about, about we as a, as, a, as a society is that survival is the strongest instinct. We'll find a way to make it work. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. I love that. Okay. And, and do you think broad sector from an M&A perspective, Randy, is there some pent up M&A demand in the mining business right now? Well, there's no doubt. Um, you know, anytime we see movement, um, if, if certain companies tend to have opportunities in front of them um, and, and there's, you know, perhaps hidden, hidden value in terms of, you know, uh, synergies that you might be able to, to align, then it'll, it'll, it'll justify that. But, you know, whenever we see markets move forward, if, if we see certain companies, uh, uh, you know, catch that wave ahead of others, that creates opportunities. Anytime there's, anytime there's a disparity in valuations between entities out there, it always opens up opportunities for M&A. Okay. okay. See much in the streaming space. Um, there is a lot of new companies coming into the streaming space. Uh, you know, as, as say, just about as many uh, new streaming companies as there is vaccines nowadays. <laughs> it seems like once a week or every couple of weeks. But uh, um, you know, that will represent an opportunity at some time in the future. Um, you know, uh, there, there, there just has to be a consolidation uh, of that space, and it, it will happen eventually. Yeah. Okay. So in October, you guys listed on the London Stock Exchange. Uh, I know you already had a substantial shareholder base in London, around 15% of your trading activity, if I'm correct. But what will this listing do for Wheaton, Randy? Yeah, 15% of our shareholder base was uh, was uh, UK based. What what we were seeing though while we were over there, and, and London, you know, essentially is almost a, a second or a third home for us. Uh, you know, we originally listed on the Toronto Stock Exchange, but a few years after that original listing back in 2004, we we listed onto the New York Stock Exchange, and and within a few years, New York became our dominant market, and and we're now probably about 60 to 70 percent trading on on New York, and and the rest on uh, on Toronto, London. Uh, be- because we didn't do a financing over there, we don't have a lot of liquidity on the London Stock Exchange. We knew that was going to be the case. But what we were seeing in all our time spent in London meeting with funds over there is that there is a lot of UK funds that have limits in terms of how much they can invest outside of the country, uh, typically you know, limited to about 10% of their, 10 to 15% of their portfolio. And these are you know, the diversified funds. They're the ones that have a, a broader reach, but they want to bring some precious metals into their portfolio. There's not a lot of options outside of Russian risk. Uh, there's not a lot of options on the London Stock Exchange. So we saw, we saw an opportunity in demand there. But the other criterion was, was the fact that, um, you know, if, if, if a fund over there has, has um, limited you know, capacity to invest outside of the UK and, and they're a diversified fund, they're probably going to be focusing on some of the big tech names, the Apples and the Facebooks and the Googles and or Alphabet or whatever the parent company are with that 10 to 15%, 10 to 15% capacity. So there was a lot of requests about whether we could actually somehow get a listing in London to allow them to invest. And what we have, you know, and, and, and hence, uh, 
you know, by our calculations, there's probably about 400 billion in assets under management looking for a, a way to expand their, their capacity uh, for investing into precious metals. So by listing in the London Stock Exchange, what it does is allows them to, uh, to own our stock now. Now, they don't have to actually acquire our stock. If you look at our trading on the London Stock Exchange, it's, it's, uh, it's almost embarrassingly low uh, in terms of volumes and liquidity. But that's because we don't have a, a, a good you know, pool of, of, of stock on that exchange yet. But what we have seen already is, is what we know of three or four funds already that have invested through the, you know, the much more liquid uh, New York Stock Exchange. But they've been allowed to now because we're listed on the LSE. They can now invest, buy, and sell our stock on on any exchange in the world. So the so the LSE is really a checkmark to give uh, give us access to a, a broader investor base. And uh, everything we've seen so far, we're pretty happy with the results. Okay, okay. And I'd love you just to talk to anybody who's looking for their next home for capital in the precious metal space. Uh, what they can expect from Wheaton. I know you're a big shareholder. Last time we sat down, I said, Randy, are you deploying capital into the precious metals market? And your answer was, I'm all in on Wheaton. And uh, you know that's what we want to hear. So uh, let's talk near term, Randy. What can people expect from Wheaton in like the one to five year time horizon? We've got a really strong growth profile. We, um, you know, uh, 2020, of course, has finished. Um, we did have to reduce our guidance a bit because of the uh, number of our mines had to suspend production early on in the pandemic. But in the end, it was about a 5% hit. And uh, as we announced at the uh, Q3 um, um, results conference call, uh, it now looks like we may have overestimated the impact that things actually look quite positive. And, uh, and so it looks like we're going to be the upper end of our guidance, which should be somewhere around 670 to 680,000 gold equivalent ounces. Uh, still, still tallying up the fine num final numbers in terms of production, but uh, so a good strong year, especially in the face of the pandemic and, and, uh, and the impacts there. Our average production over the next four years should be somewhere around 770,000 gold equivalent ounces. Um, and that's just organically in, in not counting any new acquisitions. And in fact, um, I, in fact, that doesn't count the Cozumel acquisition, which, which will add a bit also, not a lot, but a bit. Um, and so, um, you know, what, what we'll see is good, strong growth from a number of assets. Uh, earlier this morning, we saw HUD Bay announce that they've got their final uh, permits for the Papaconcha zone done in Peru. So they expect to get that up and running. That's going to substantially increase the, that Papaconcha zone has substantially higher precious metal grades. And so when they start putting that ore through the mill, we're going to see a, a, a nice big uptake in, in, in gold and silver production from, from the Constancia project with HUD Bay. We've also got, you know, the strongest, the highest grades we've ever seen coming out of the Penasquito mine with, uh, with Newmont over the next few years. And, uh, and so, you know, very good, strong silver production from that Penasquito operation. Um, you know, continued growth in a number of different opportunities. We just started receiving our first cobalt from the, um, you know, Voices Bay operation with Vale. And so we'll, we'll now just added our fourth commodity into our trading mix. Uh, that started as of January 1st of this year. Uh, probably won't report revenues because you know what, what we're seeing is that the the production pipeline in terms of working it from production through to sales um, in 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 uh, bulk commodity sales like cobalt is 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 going to take two to three months to get us uh, to the point of having sales, but uh, but we will see that that'll that'll bump our production by about two to three percent, our overall gold equivalent production by about two to three percent over the over the year. And then probably the most exciting thing that we're going to have over the next while is the Saloba mine down in Brazil, which is our flagship operation. It's an incredible copper asset that produces substantive amount of gold. Uh, you know, 2019, it delivered close to 270,000 gold ounces to us. And, uh, and we just, you know, their Vale is um, you know, most of the way through a third phase of expansion. They expect to be turning on the, the switches on that expansion next year in 2022. Uh, which will increase throughput capacity by 50%. And, um, and they're in the process of updating their mining plan. They had a very successful drilling campaign. Uh, and so we're expecting to see updated resources, reserves, and an updated mining plan that should really highlight the strength we're going to see out of that Slobo asset. Uh, we've, we've actually taken a pretty conservative approach to our forecasting. And so I think there's a, a strong chance that, that uh, when, when that update comes from Vale, that, that we'll see a, a significant bump to the upside. Um, and so, you know, just organically, we just, everything seems to be 
purring. Everything seems to be just ticking along. Nice growth. Uh, I, you know, I'll point to the team at First Majestic with San Damas, where they're opening up, uh, you know, the Silverich areas and continuing to expand and improve the, the milling capacity down there, uh, improving recoveries and improving throughput capacity. Um, you know, uh, still water uh, where we get our palladium and some gold from uh, uh, continuing to strive towards, um, you know, their blitz project where they're trying to maximize mill capacity. Uh, their, their mills were only running about 70 to 80 percent capacity. So they're opening up more working faces to try and deliver more. Just everywhere I look, we've got a good, strong portfolio that continues to be, you know, and it's one of the reasons why we focus on high margin assets is because our partners are motivated to continue reinvesting into these mines and, and growing them. And, uh, and we're getting the, we're reaping the benefit of that. I love it. Okay. Randy, thank you so much for catching up for anybody who's curious. The ticker is WPM on the TSX, the NYSE and the London exchange. I love getting your perspective, Randy. Really appreciate you coming back on the show and updating my audience. Uh, so thank you. Thank you, Jay. Always a pleasure.